sponsored by New Orleans Distillers, creators of fine spirits and liqueurs. Through dedication to science, art, and passion, blends of tradition and flavor emerge. For you, always locally crafted. New Orleans Distillers, classically Southern. Tonight, if you're hitting the road this Memorial weekend, it'll cost you. All indexes finished higher for the week, and the Dow Jones breaks an eight-week losing streak. Is the worst over, or is this just a false bottom? We've got that and more tonight on this Friday, May the 27th, 2022. Hi, I'm Andre Laborde. Welcome to Wall Street Wrap Up for this Friday, May the 27th, 2022. I hope your week went well. Well, today starts the beginning of the Memorial Day weekend. And as in previous years, Americans love to hit the road for a longer three-day weekend. Well, this year, though, if you're driving or flying, it's going to be more expensive. Plus, this marks the first time in 16 days that gas prices have not seen new highs. Is this going to be a trend? We'll see. Well, this weekend, three million more people are expected to be flying. If it's you or if you know someone who's going to be using the airports this weekend, there will be some complaining and frustrations going on. Airfares are at a five-year high. Two reasons for the increased cost. First, the demand is there, so they're going to charge more. And airlines are all trying to offset their higher fuel cost. And if you're driving this weekend, that'll cost you more. Gas is now over $4 in every part of the country. It's $4 a gallon, with the average price of gas across the country now at $4.60 for regular. And in California, such as in Los Angeles and San Francisco, prices are over $6 a gallon. Hawaii comes in second with the average of $5.43 a gallon, and Nevada has $5.24. And according to a recent report by J.P. Morgan this summer, by August, we could be seeing $6 a gallon of gas nationwide. Well, what a great lead into our guest coming up tonight. Now, this evening, we're going to be talking oil and gas, price at the pumps, and why the Biden administration is restricting drilling on federal land. Coming up tonight, we'll be talking to Dan Brouillette. Dan, he knows the industry as a former U.S. Secretary of Energy, and now Dan's the president of Sempra Infrastructure Oil and Gas, coming up later on. But first, how did the markets do this weekend? Well, it was good. It was touch and go earlier in the week, but all the indexes ended in the green and the Dow Jones ended an eight week losing streak. Are we now at the bottom and are we headed up? Well, time will tell. And this week, the Dow Jones ended at 33,213, up over 6% for the week. And the S&P 500, they closed at 4,158. They were up 6.5%. And the NASDAQ, they ended at 12,131, up over 6.75% for the week. Well, let's get to our guest tonight. This evening, Dan Bouillette was both Undersecretary of Energy and he was also the former U.S. Secretary of Energy under the Trump administration. Now he's president of Sempra Infrastructure, one of the country's largest energy network of pipelines. What a great guest for this time. Hi, Dan. Welcome to Wall Street Wrap-Up. Thank you, Andre. Great to be with you. 18 months ago, we were energy independent. So we were actually producing more energy that we were needing. And in fact, we were actually exporting oil and gas as compared to today. Are my figures correct? Is that true? That is true, Andre. Uh, When I served as both Deputy Secretary and Secretary of Energy, I was uh, really privileged and honored to to oversee a department that produced so much of the research and development and assisted the industry uh, in its efforts to produce more energy here in America. And we did, in fact, during that period in 2019 and 2020 to some extent, but we had a pandemic then, uh, became what we refer to as energy independent. We became more precisely a net energy exporter. So at that time, we were producing roughly 12 and a half, maybe 12.7 or 9, 8 or 9 in that range, million barrels per day uh, of oil. Uh, We were also producing an enormous amount of of gas, natural gas here in the United States, so much so that we surpassed Saudi Arabia and Russia and became the world's largest producer of both oil and gas. So a tremendous achievement, a tremendous accomplishment for the American industry and for the American people. 
Well, if we were, let's say we were producing, and, and my figures were all basically almost like yours, because I had, like in 2019, we were producing about 13 million barrels, but let's say 12 million, 12 mm -hmm. million barrels. Mm -hmm. Today, we're probably producing maybe, what, 10 or 11 percent less than that? Maybe a little lower than that, maybe more than 10 percent less. We're producing, uh, I'd have to look at the exact figure, but it's somewhere close to 11, perhaps uh, maybe 10 and a half million barrels per day. And that's been one of the challenges that we face in America as well as the rest of the world. Demand has continued to grow as we recover from this pandemic and this period of, of uh, diminished economic activity. So what's happening is when the pandemic hit, investment in production went down as a result of lower demand. But uh, what's happening is demand's coming back and we haven't been able to ramp up our production quite as quickly. So it's creating scarcity in the marketplace, which is obviously creating higher prices for consumers all around the world. From what I understand, Dan, is that in fact, J.P. Morgan had an energy conference about a about a month ago, maybe it might have even been a couple of months ago, yeah. and I think it was in Houston, Texas, and they gave the figure out that in ten, in the next t ten years, which would be twenty by 2020, 2032, they'll be needing the United States will be needing about twenty percent more energy than they're producing right now. Are those figures what what you're hearing as well? Yeah, I, I would tend to agree with that, and it's consistent with the other studies that I've seen. So studies that have come from from, for instance the uh, International Energy Administration, which is based out of Paris, France, as well as from the Energy Information Administration, which was part of the department that I ran as secretary, all of their studies show that we're going to have increased demand for both oil and gas, perhaps as long as uh, throughout 2050. So for the next two, perhaps three decades, uh, oil and gas are going to be an important part of our energy portfolio. And uh, I've not yet seen a credible study to contradict those numbers. I've heard the the problem is some state where in the E&P, exploration and production. I've also heard, well, it's the refineries. We haven't built a refinery in so long that the refineries are at capacity. Um, first off, have you heard that? Is that true? Or is it because of regulatory roadblocks? It's because of both. Uh, there's no question about that. It's because of both. It's very difficult to get a permit to build a new refinery in America today. Um, that's just an acknowledge, acknowledgement of the reality that we face today. Uh, we have a, a very aggressive, um, litigious um, community here in America, and they challenge permits each and every day that are filed either with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, the EPA, uh, any other state agency that you can possibly imagine. It's just very, very difficult to get these permits approved to build new facilities. As a result, the facilities that are up and operating are, in fact, at capacity. Now, some have closed. I'm aware of one uh, around the Philadelphia area that is still closed due to a large fire and a, an accident that happened last year. They've not yet been able to open up that facility. Uh, but there are others who have switched from refining uh, diesel and gasoline to things like biodiesel. And when you do that, it becomes a much less efficient uh, facility. So they're not producing the volumes of refined product that, uh, that we would like to see. And that's creating, a, again, some scarcity in the marketplace. But I would also add another element to this as well. Uh, you know, we've not yet developed in America enough infrastructure to move those refined products around very easily. So we need additional pipeline capacity, for instance, to move refined product from the region in which I grew up down in Louisiana uh, in, in, in the Texas region up to the Northeast, for instance. So we have to do a much better job of getting that type of infrastructure built as well. Well, with the climate that we're talking about right now, like let's say with the Biden administration, uh, where they're canceling such as like, and I'm thinking of Keystone Pipeline uh, about 14 months ago, um, one of the first things that was done new additional pipelines to be able to trans transport from one part of the country to the other. I is that just basically just off the table right now with because of the administration? It, it is candidly much more easier to build an intrastate pipeline. For instance, we can build pipelines out of the Permian in Texas out to the Gulf Coast to get things like natural gas and, and oil to the coastline and off to the oceans uh, than it is to build an interstate pipeline. Uh, we have had some progress that's being made at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission in D.C., but it's a much slower process than it needs to be. And uh, I've been working closely with 
colleagues in Washington, with uh, others in the industry, to see what we might do to help the FERC, to help others uh, appreciate the importance of this infrastructure and to appreci appreciate the um, not only the energy benefits that come from it, but also the national security benefits that come from it. Uh, this is critical infrastructure to America, uh, to, to America's economy, but also to its national security. When we are energy independent, as we just talked about, if we are energy sufficient, uh, then we have a much uh, broader range of uh, options when it comes to dealing with situations like Russia and Ukraine or potentially China. And uh, I think the regulators are coming around to that point of view, but we have some work to be done there. Where, where we were energy independent 18 months ago, we're right now negotiating, and I say the, the Biden administration is negotiating with Venezuela and Iran for importing oil from those two countries. And what I'm trying to get my, my head wrapped around is that, to my understanding, that there, the United States, the Biden administration is asking from Venezuela alone one million barrels a day. Well, they're only producing, from what I understand, 700,000 barrels a day. So they can't even produce what we're asking for. It, are these the figures you're getting? It is, and, and, and of the of the figures you just mentioned, I mean, of that seven hundred thousand or so, it may be a little higher now. I haven't looked at those figures in a little while, but a lot of that is for internal consumption as well. So, I mean, their ability to export that may be questionable. I'm not really sure, but I think the bigger picture here, the bigger question to be asked is why would we ask them in the first place? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a communist regime. It's Maduro is not a good actor on the national stage. Uh, it, it's sort of questionable as to why we would even ask that question of the Venezuelans or even the Iranians or anyone else that we may be talking about. We do have the production capabilities here in the United States. Uh, we've shown that. And I think that uh, with additional innovation and additional technology coming out of the marketplace, we could perhaps even increase that 13 million number uh, that you talked about earlier. So uh, we do have, in fact, the ability to take care of our own and to become, again, energy independent. I saw an interview you did uh, previously, and you said, except for whale oil, um, no energy source was ever done away with and, and replaced by another energy source. Now, there may be others that might be producing more, and by that I mean wood mm -hmm. energy was then coal. Coal was mm -hmm. with uh, oil and gas. Oil and gas may be also with nuclear, but the others weren't completely taken off the table. So is this what you're talking about? Yeah, that's exactly right. It, it takes an enormous amount of energy today to power this incredible economy that we have here in the United States. And if you think about the size of the economy in China and the size of the economy in Europe, you know, you multiply that, uh, it, the numbers become exponential in size, the amount of energy that you need. And when you look back at, at, at the history of mankind, again, as I said, you know, with the possible exception of whale oil, which is still being used in the marketplace, but in very small numbers, uh, we've not ever replaced a fuel source. We burn more wood and biomass today than we did 200 years ago or 300 years ago. We burn more coal today. We burn more natural gas today. We burn more uh, oil today. If you look at oil consumption, for instance, only 20 years ago, maybe a little bit longer than that, 25 years ago, the world was consuming about 60 to 70 million barrels per day of oil. Today, we do 100 plus million barrels per day. So it's always been additive. We've always added more. We've never taken things out of the energy stack. And again, it's because we just need more and more energy because our economies are growing, our populations are growing. And as we think about the developing world, they want some of the very same things that we take for granted here in the United States, access to basic electricity, uh, access to cooking gas in your home, for instance. So sometimes those things aren't available in places uh, around the world or like India or perhaps Africa. So as those countries begin to come online, the demand for energy just continues to grow. And, you know, that's why when you read those studies, like the one you referenced with J.P. Morgan or perhaps EIA, you show an increased demand for natural gas, for instance. So that's the world in which we're living. It's going to take all forms of energy, and we just have to produce more of it in order to meet the needs of, a, of the citizens around the world. When you listen to the, the Biden administration, they're saying that oil, oil companies are sitting on, I think the, the, the number was 7,000, 7,000 unused leases, uh, but they're not spudding any wells. They're not starting any wells. Um, and the oil companies are saying 
but that's that's only a small picture. That's not talking about the regulatory. What's the what's the true story? Um, you know, look, it, it, it's you know, th- there's a there's a thread of truth in that statement that there are seven thousand or so, whatever the number is, permits out there that are. Uh, either pending, not being used, or perhaps being used, but not to the fullest extent. But it's a bit disingenuous to suggest that the industry is not utilizing to the fullest extent the access that they have to those permits. You know, the permit is only the first step. The lease permit is only the first step in a very long and expensive process. You know, because you have the right to drill on somebody's property or a piece of property, it doesn't mean that you get to you, know, you don't need a permit to build a road to get to the part of the land that you need to get to in order to actually place a well. You still have to get uh, access, you know, to you have to get pipeline permits to get that product should you find oil on that land out to the marketplace. It's only the first step in a very long process. So it's a bit disingenuous to suggest that the industry is sitting on some permits that they just don't want to use for some reason. The, the Biden administration has stopped oil, new, fed, new oil leases in the Gulf of Mexico and in Alaska, two areas that are very rich in oil and, and natural gas. So I'd sort of like what you're saying before, where the oil and gas leases may be accepted of those 7,000, but EPA and other regulatory agencies are slow walking. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very long process. You, you're going to need federal approval for things like pipelines, as I just mentioned. You're going to need federal approval for other aspects, perhaps bringing electricity to the site. Uh, you're going to need local approval for things like roads and highways and access to land. Uh, you're going to need air permits. You're going to need all sorts of activity from governmental agencies. You may have to go to as many as six or seven federal agencies and a few state agencies in order to actually affect the economic value of the initial lease that's been granted uh, for the land itself. So it's, that's why I say it's a bit disingenuous to say that, well, the Department of Interior or the State Department of Interior has granted a permit and they're just not using it or a lease and they're just not using it. That's not the full story. Most oil and gas executives figure out an around the autumn time, of what they will be uh, leasing and also drilling for the next year. This coming August, September, October, they're going to be figuring out where they're going to be, where and how much are they going to be spending for leases for 2023. Given the climate that we're in, and when I say the climate, I'm talking about the Biden administration, I'm talking about the anti-fossil fuel feelings in Washington, D.C. Uh, do you think that oil company executives are going to be wanting to um, go out on the limb and, 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 and make uh, uh, expenses or investments for 2023? I can't speak for others, um, but I can, I can suggest just, you know, generically or conceptually that it's very difficult as a, as a CEO or president of a company to place what, what can be billions of dollars at risk if you suspect that the regulatory environment uh, may expropriate the value of those investments over the course of the next four or five or six years. You know, we have a fiduciary responsibility to our shareholders, our owners, to create value for our firms. So if you're going to put that money at risk, you have to demonstrate that you're doing so wisely, you're doing so prudently, and you're honoring the fiduciary responsibility that you have to them for their investments. And uh, as we continue to Uh, see Washington or perhaps others um, talk down the industry, for lack of a better way to describe it, uh, or create uh, uh, somewhat um, confusing or or convoluted regulatory structures. You know, it's hard to see the value of those investments. And as such, you may see some diminished investment. And I think that's some of what we're feeling today in the marketplace. But as we look forward, we have to make sure that governments, regulators in particular, are encouraging the development of this industry here in the United States. And if they do so, I think you're going to see that investment will follow very quickly. We're talking with Dan Brugget. We're very happy to have him. He's the president of Sempra Infrastructure, former Secretary of Energy. Don't go away. We'll be right back.
We're talking right now with Dan Briette. Dan is the president of Sempra Infrastructure, also former Secretary of Energy. J.P. Morgan came out about a week ago with a report that this coming summer, uh, August to be exact, that oil, uh, that uh, gasoline at the pumps could be $6 a gallon nationwide. Now, and I'm not talking about California. I'm just talking nationwide. Uh, first off, do you see that that gas will be going to that price? And if so, what, what type of an effect on the economy do you think that would be? I, I do think we're in for a difficult summer. Uh, American drivers, American consumers are in for a difficult summer. Uh, I don't know what the exact price of gasoline is going to be in August, but I can tell you it's probably going to be higher than what it is right now. We're facing severe constraints in the marketplace, and uh, the ability to refine product, to move it around the country very efficiently, very easily, is somewhat under pressure. So I think we have to address that as a nation. Uh, but the, the long-term effects of this, I think, are going to be more problematic than people may realize at the moment. Uh, natural gas, diesel in particular, is such an important economic input into the rest of the economy. And as those truckers pay perhaps 6 or 7 or $8 a gallon for diesel, we're going to start to see that being reflected into the price of consumer products all across the country. So I think we're in for a, a bit of a tough period with the economy. I, I think it's important for us to address energy policy as a nation. I think the administration has begun that process. There's still much more work to be done. It's important that we balance the equation on energy policy. It can't be viewed solely through the lens or the, the exclusive lens of climate change. It's much more important than that. Energy security does matter. Economic security does matter. You know, Dan, it's amazing me when you said about climate change and such, and, and I know the administration once are very, is very environmentally conscious, but instead of, impo instead of the, uh, creating our own oil and gas here in the United States, we're bringing it in from tankers. I've read where that a tanker takes 2,000 gallons an hour to, to burn for a tanker to be used, and the carbon that it emits is much more than if we could just pump it out of our own ground. Yeah, that's true. No, that's true. That's absolutely true. And, uh, you know, as we think about what we have here in America, I mean, again, I'll get back to that point about infrastructure, which is so key. I mean, you can pipe gas, you can pipe oil very, very efficiently, very safely, I should add, as well. And, um, you know, with, with minimal uh, environmental impacts. And that's something that I think not only, you know, we need to address as a country, it's what the administration needs to focus on as well. And, you know, you mentioned earlier the administration being focused on things like climate and environmental uh, security. So are we in the industry. The industry has taken a very, very aggressive stance on things like methane emissions. Uh, it's been this industry, as a matter of fact, that's led the effort uh, to capture fugitive emissions. And if you think about that, it makes all the sense in the world. We obviously have an economic or a, we have an environmental reason for doing so, but we also have an economic reason for doing so. If we can capture that, that, that gas that's being leaked or emitted from our pipelines or from our facilities, then we can put that back into the marketplace and to the extent we can increase even more the supply of gas available to consumers, then we're going to reduce the price over time. Uh, but it's important that we as a nation uh, look at energy policy through a balanced approach, not a singular approach. It can't be just climate change. It can't be just, you know, economics. It has to include our security aspects, our environmental aspects, and, of course, our economic aspects. Uh, a recent uh, oil analyst on, a, on another business network, and they were saying how the only way that to be reducing the demand for gas at the pumps right now is if we have a recession or if the world goes into a global recession. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm curious, do you think like it's like what you were just talking before about diesel uh, there and where we started our whole conversation off with refineries that they're retooling from diesel to other types of fuels of other types of gases. So that means there'll be less diesel on the market, which means there'll be less diesel for truckers, which means their prices were going to be going up. Do you see a possible mm -hmm. recession either for the United States or globally? Oh, I think unchecked, there's no question. There's no question whatsoever. I mean, we can't have prices uh, simply run away from the, from the consumers. You'll start to see demand destruction. If people see $10 a gallon gasoline, they're not going to drive. So you're going to start to see demand destruction, which leads to a recession in the long run. But these are pretty basic economics. I mean, your two options are either to destroy the demand, get people to buy less of the product, or you can simply produce more and increase the supply. Uh, it's economics 101. If you increase the supply, 
you have more competition in the marketplace, prices will come down eventually. They'll stabilize at a minimum. And that's something you know, I think the, the, the regulators, um, you know, the administration in Washington, state administration across the country are coming to grips with and beginning to recognize that uh, we're, we're probably going to have to choose one of those two. And I might suggest that the better option would be to produce more here in America. And uh, as a result, we'll start to see some stabilization in the marketplace. The Biden administration is talking about, or I should say they are, releasing fuel from the Strategic Petroleum Reserves. And I, I, I want to say I remember 180 million barrels that they're doing it. Will this have any kind of negligible effect on what we're just talking about? It will have some minor effects at the margins. I do think the last release of 180 million barrels was perhaps the right decision. That's what the reserve is there for. It's when you have an actual supply disruption. So with the events in Russia, with the events in Ukraine, uh, I think that was a fair decision for the president to make. It's probably the right thing to release that oil. Um, at, you know, at, the, at the pump, you're not going to see much of, a, of an impact only because uh, you can only release it so fast out of the reserve. Uh, but it is the right thing to do to put that, that oil into the marketplace, given the events overseas. The question becomes, at what price do you, can you replace it, and are you going to replace it? And that's really some questions that are going to face both the Congress and the administration over the course of the next few months. Dan, I hope you come back so we can answer those questions that you're talking about. Thank you, Andre. It's great to be with you. I hope you have him back. Thanks a lot, Dan. Well, if you've got a question about finance or a comment about the show, we would love to hear from you. Make it pithy, make it concise, and write us at Andre at WallStreetWrapUp.info. And now for a look ahead for the market information for next week. But first, what well-known stock index was first published on this day? And we'll have that answer in just a moment. Well, what well-known stock index was first published on this day? The Dow Jones, first published on this day in 1896. It originally had 12 initial members. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is 126 years old today. And by the way, not one of the original members of the Dow Jones is still on the index. GE, General Electric, was the last company to be taken out, and that was, wasn't that long ago in 2018. Well. Coming up next week, we're going to be talking with the former chairman of the SEC, Harvey Pitt, from Elon Musk's running battles with the SEC, insider trading, and, and now the new chairman of the SEC, adding climate change to their regulations and regulatory things. They, they're st straying from the original mandate. We're going to be discussing that next week with the former chairman of the SEC, Harvey Pitt. And as a reminder, we repeat the show on Sunday mornings, but the best way is to set your DVR so you'll never miss an episode. And that is our show for this Friday, May the 27th, 2022. I hope you enjoyed it. My thanks so much to Dan Bruyette for joining us this evening. But as always, it's you. We appreciate you for allowing us into your homes tonight. Remember, you can always follow us on all the social media on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and WYES.org. So enjoy your Memorial Weekend ahead. Have a great weekend, a safe one, and a productive week as well. I'll see you next week for Wall Street Wrap-Up. I'm Andre Laborde. Remember, money never sleeps. Good night. Sponsored by New Orleans Distillers, creators of fine spirits and liqueurs. Through dedication to science, art, and passion, blends of tradition and flavor emerge. For you, always locally crafted. New Orleans Distillers, classically Southern.